I welcome you today to another important topic something that I came across recently uh, this is a position paper by the Fleischner Society of Radiology which talks about a new terminology called interstitial lung abnormalities now we're going to see a lot of this terminology in our CT reports so it's important to know what does this mean by a radiologist's perspective so let's get started this position paper was published in Lancet in 2020 and it talks about the very common issue of varying terminologies which are used by radiologists to describe ILD-like changes in the lung. So we have all seen early ILD, early phase ILD, subclinical, preclinical, so on and so forth. So many descriptions of interstitial changes. So now there is a common terminology that has been proposed in this paper, which is interstitial lung abnormality. By definition, when a radiologist writes the term interstitial lung abnormality, he intends to pass on the message that it is an incidental finding on the CT scan because the history was not asking for a diagnosis suggestive of ILD. He does not know the case. So when he sees any interstitial lung change, which is consistent with the pattern revolving around ILDs, it would be termed as ILAs rather than using different terms. So it is a radiological finding. It is an incidental finding and there is no clinical suspicion of the disease based on the history which has been told to the radiologist. So it's important to understand that in our patients who are high risk groups for ILD, like patients who are known to have connective tissue disorders or patients who are already on drugs that can cause ILD, in such cases, if an ILA is reported by a radiologist, it could still be a preclinical ILD or it could still be an early ILD change. So we have to correlate it with the clinical setup of our patient. It's also been mentioned in this position paper that it is a very common finding and retrospective data that has been collated has shown that in smokers or in elderly people, it is even more common. So it could just be present without any clinical implication in a smoker who's an elderly. Now what has to be taken care of that these can progress, they can be responsible for more complications and more mortality. So we cannot dismiss these findings. So the clinical significance is really in determining whether this is an active ILD or it is just a finding. And if it's an active ILD, then what is the type that of this interstitial lung abnormality so that you can monitor your patient. Now, if the radiologist mentions it as ILA and not ILD, it definitely does not imply that we will not find signs, symptoms of the disease. So now we have to look for signs and symptoms in these patients and we have to make sure that we clinically examine them. If these significant signs or symptoms are there, we will now call them as ILD rather than an ILA. By definition, the radiologists define these as non-dependent abnormalities which involve more than 5% of any lung zone. Now, this 5% is a very arbitrary value which is based on the observations in previous published literature. Most of the data taken for this paper is retrospective data. So, 5% is arbitrarily taken. So, whether it's in the upper zone, middle zone or lower zone of the lung, if 5% or more involved area has those changes then it will be termed as ILA. It can further be subcategorized which has a very good prognostic significance and then we can come to know whether we need to see this patient more frequently or not. So one of the subcategory is ground glass opacity and reticular opacity but no subpleural localization. The other is ground glass opacity with reticular opacities and predominant subpleural localization without fibrosis. And the worst probably with the highest risk of progression would be the one with honeycombing, tractional bronchiectasis, so more in favor of UIP. The other, other uh, similar findings which can be taken as an ILA could be non emphysematous cysts which are not like the honeycomb cysts because these have a well-defined wall they are irregular 
and these are very commonly seen in cigarette smokers they have a chance of progression and these are also included in the definition of ila again the location will be most important in prognosis so non subplural will be usually non progressive and subplural will be more progressive when we talk about subplural ila specifically they have more prognostic significance so these will then further be seen whether they are fibrotic or non fibrotic if they are fibrotic there will be more risk of progression for this patient more risk of mortality at 5 year of follow up so these patients have to be looked into carefully and if fibrosis is present the further categorization into typical indeterminate or probable uip will be done as per guidelines for ilds there is a very beautiful panel and several of these present in this position paper which is a quick revision or summary of the most important points which are portrayed by the paper and these can be read into how do we work up our patients with ila so if your radiologist reports it as an ila if you have not done a dedicated hrct scan and it was an incidental finding say on an abdominal ct scan we saw the lower lobes of the lung and we saw these ilas or the patient underwent the scan in suspicion of a pneumonia and found out to have an ila so based on the type of scan done earlier if needed it's recommended that an hrct should be done thin section less than 1.5 mm if you are suspecting that there could be dependent atrial actosis it's better to do a prone view and an expiratory view in case we are suspecting hypersensitivity pneumonitis who can have ila the data has been collated by this paper and they have mentioned a few risk factors advanced stage being one of them and a very interesting point that has also been shown is that every 10 year increase in age has been shown to have 2.2 times more increase in odd of detecting an ila the other risk factors are males smokers whether or not they have copd and interestingly it not only depends on the activity so current or previous smoker but also the quantity of tobacco smoke exposure and that can be a modifiable risk factor in case of active smokers who are found to have an ila there's also been a very interesting fact that has been shown that in certain lung studies like the framingham heart study and the mesa lung study they have found some association with increased exposure to air pollutants and the presence of ila so something again that can be used as a modifiable risk factor if your patient is exposed to a lot of traffic pollution air pollution and has been found to have a new onset ila but no clinical evidence of ild this can be used to change the appear the presence of this risk factor in future for the patient and there've also been some genetic correlation with muc5b gene again well summarized in a panel which you can use as a uh, as a small uh, snapshot and then you can refer to it whenever you see an ila how should ilas be monitored they've looked into it and the consensus is that we still do not have optimal evidence to give clear cut guidelines on when you will be following these patients definitely patients who are at risk of developing an ild will be followed up more patients who are having more uh, worse prognosis types like the subplural fibrotic ones the ones with tractional dilatation will be followed up more but the standard evaluation for ruling out an active ild is very important once an ila is reported on a ct for follow up scans a follow up scan at 12 to 24 months is uh, reasonable for patients who now develop new onset symptoms and they do not have the symptoms at the time of the ct the appropriate timing though of clinical evaluation is still to be noted as per guideline purpose the clinical experience has shown in several data that they have correlated that a good a scan repeated at 3 to 12 months based on again the progression or symptoms of the patient is will be good and additional follow up beyond a year could also be done they've also tried to quantify the ila and they found that high attenuation areas could be used as a good marker of the severity they've given a, a very nice um, 
example where a patient was followed up after five years. Initially, the baseline CT did not show um, any fibrosis. Uh, it was subplural non-fibrotic abnormalities. And later on, they found at five years that there was a clear progression and data-driven analysis, textural analysis showed that the extents of fibrosis had increased to 1 to 5 percent. So this is something that can be used in future for uh, assessing the quantification. A word of caution is with surgical patients. If, if a patient which is due for surgery or chemotherapy has an ILA, please take it as a comorbidity in planning the treatment. These patients are at more risk of drug-induced nematitis. These patients are more risk at respiratory failure uh, post the surgery or procedure or chemotherapy. When you are ventilating these patients, we have to be careful with low pressure, low volume modes. And we have to be careful with what drugs we used in these patients. So for surgical patients, it's a very, very important comorbidity to have an ILA. They've given a very good example of a patient who was uh, a patient with lung cancer. A pre-op CT showed just mild subplural interstitial abnormality. There was no fibrosis. But later on, the patient, after taking a, a cycle of chemo with pemetrixin, developed drug glassing compatible with drug-induced pneumonitis. And he also developed a fusion and the patient worsened. So having an ILA was a pre-existing comorbidity or risk factor of complications. Again, it's well summarized in this panel. You could take a screenshot of this and keep with you for further references. Few examples that are uh, beautifully given in the paper. One is of various subcategories of ILAs. The first one you see is non-subplural, non-fibrotic, just a ground glass abnormality and uh, more central in location. The second one is subplural and it is also non-fibrotic but subplural ground glass and linear abnormalities, no fibrosis. And the third one, uh, traction bronchiectasis, architectural distortion and this probably will fit into UIP pattern in the future. So this is how it can be subcategorized. There are certain which are non-ILAs like this paraspinal fibrosis is not to be noted as an ILA. Then central lobular nodularity, this is a heavy smoker. So poorly defined ground glass, central lobular nodules, no other interstitial abnormality picked up on the CT scan will not be categorized as an ILA. And the third one, if you see, now if it's a unilateral or it's just a focal abnormality, it will not be categorized as an ILA. This is how ILAs can progress to YLD. You look here, it is a prone high resolution CT. The basis shows subplural lung abnormality, primarily ground glass, and then it can progress further. Coming to this flowchart, a very nice flowchart which is given uh, where an identification of ILA, you could do a CT if not done properly, see if it fits into an ILD classification and treat. Else it is an ILA, you actively monitor the patient and some patients may require expectant management, reduce the risk factor and reassess. Thank you very much. See you soon with another topic.